fantastic to have you all here, and it's amazing to have Graham with us. Uh, it's not every day that we get Graham here in Cambridge, so it's quite remarkable. It's great to have you here. Good to be here. Good yeah. to see you again. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Graham's new book is America Before, and it is taking uh, everyone by storm. It seems like there's so many new facts in this book that support all the work that you've been doing over the past three decades. That whole three decades of research, going through this, uh, opening up the Sphinx and the date of the Sphinx, um, coming really from a background working at Economist magazine, a totally different world, and then walking into this mystery, how did it happen? Um, I, for years, regarded myself as uh, totally about current affairs. I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't have any interest in history at all. Um, and I was uh, the East Africa correspondent for The Economist, and that meant that I was based in Nairobi, in Kenya. And neighboring countries were, were on my beat. And one of those countries was Ethiopia, uh, which was in a state of civil war in the 1980s. Uh, and I found myself during that war in the city of Aksum, uh, where, to my surprise, I discovered that they claimed to possess the lost Ark of the Covenant. Um, and uh, it hadn't been long before that I'd seen the Indiana Jones movie, you know. Uh, so That's good timing. My journalistic instinct said there's a good story here, but it clearly wasn't a current affair story. Yes. Uh, and I kind of put it on the back burner and began to look into it as and when I had time to look mm -hmm. into it. And, and as I began to look into it more deeply, I found A, that uh, archaeologists were extremely dismissive of and um, uh, full of um, dislike for the Ethiopian claim, which they regarded to be a total fantasy. Mm -hmm. Uh, and at the same time, I found that there was really solid evidence on the ground in Ethiopia that they didn't appear to be considering. Uh, for example, the presence of an indigenous community of Old Testament Jews in Ethiopia. Uh, and their story was not being taken into account. Uh, and the more I looked at it, the more I felt that, uh, the, the, the mainstream historians and archaeologists were not serving uh, Ethiopia well, uh, and, that the, and that the story deserved to be told. And I, began, I, I, I set out to tell it as an investigative journalist, exploring um, a, a mystery and exploring, to some extent, a cover-up. Uh, and and uh, in that process, I got drawn more generally into the mysteries of the past. So it, it wasn't really a particular moment or a particular instant. It was just that a story attracted my attention, which involved the remote past. Uh, and um, I, and I, took it, I took it from there. While researching that book, I, I became interested in the possibility of a lost civilization, and that ultimately led to Fingerprints of the Gods, which is the book I'm best known for. Yes, absolutely. And that's a remarkable book. That is uh, from 1995. Fingerprints was published in 1995. The previous book, the book on the Ark of the Covenant, uh, was called The Sign and the Seal, A Quest for the Lost Ark of the Covenant, and that was published in 1992. Uh, and as part of the research for that book, I needed to go to Egypt. It was the, it was the first time that I'd visited Egypt. And, found myself in front of the majesty and mystery of the Great Pyramid. Um, and, and again, found myself confronted by explanations from the mainstream, which certainly did not satisfy me, uh, and, and, and which I felt were leaving, leaving things out, out of the picture. It didn't, it didn't seem to me uh, conceivable that this uh, extraordinary uh, monument, which is 481 feet high, and has a, a footprint of 13 acres and weighs 6 million tons and is so precisely aligned to true north. It's, it's just you know, 3 sixtieths of a single degree off true north. Uh, it seemed to me uh, to diminish the whole importance of the thing to suggest that it was simply the tomb of a megal megalomaniac pharaoh. I mean, you can have a huge tomb, if you like, but to take the trouble of orienting it within three sixtieths of a single degree of true north uh, suggests that something else is going on in the picture. And I wanted to look at that and I wanted to see, just as I had in Ethiopia, uh, is there an, uh, an alternative story to be told? 
Is there, is there something that isn't being considered? Uh, and this, this led me ultimately to the notion that we are a species with amnesia and that there is very likely at least one major forgotten episode uh, of civilization uh, in, in, in the human story. And, and Fingerprints of the Gods was the first book where I really took that challenge on and documented it in great depth. Absolutely. Um, and it's a remarkable book. Even now, some 24 years later, that book still, uh, you know, they're still finding out things. They're still catching up with so many of the things. I'm, I'm, I'm also grateful that, that my readers still 25, 24, 25 years after that book was published still find it, still find it useful. Uh, one thing that, that I really appreciate is when, is when people tell me that they've taken fingerprints of the gods to the Giza Plateau or they've taken it to Sacsayhuaman and, and Cusco in, yes. the, in the Andes and, and found it a, a useful guide mm -hmm. uh, to, get, to get around those sites and be, begin to do ex explorations for, them, for themselves. That's the part of what I hope to do is to open the door for, for others. Uh, to do their own investigations and, and explorations, and and more more generally, I think that's a that's a healthy thing. I think that that we tend to leave very important issues to so-called specialists or experts in our society, and say, well, that's the experts who have to deal with that, and that's not my problem. Um, and and uh, I think that that disempowers us as a general public. I think it is our problem, and I don't think we should leave everything to experts. Uh, I mean, I don't claim that I should be flying a plane, you know, I've not been, I've not been trained. I'd rather, have, I'd rather have a trained pilot fly my, fly my plane. Uh, but when it comes to issues of the human past, I think it's much more interpretive and I think everybody has a role to play in investigating that. No question. Um, you know, fascinating to me that it's not armchair research with you. You're, you're deep into it when you're doing these things. Underworld, for example, um, you're going and you're diving under dangerous conditions. Um, My wife Santa and I did um, seven years of pretty intense uh, scuba diving, uh, looking at uh, structures that were submerged by rising sea levels at the end of the last ice age. Again, it was, it, it was an issue that I felt wasn't being well served by, by archaeology. There are certain areas of the Earth's surface today uh, which have benefited if that's the right word, from relatively minimal archaeological investigation. And one of those is the continental shelves. Uh, sea level at the peak of the last ice age 21,000 years ago was, was 400 feet lower than it is today. And that's because all of that water was locked up in enormous ice caps on top of North America and Northern Europe. Uh, and it was the melting of those ice caps, sometimes very radically and suddenly, which then led to the rise in sea level that covered those exposed continental shelves. So in, in terms of statistics, you're looking at, at roughly 10 million square miles of land that was above water 21,000 years ago. That's underwater today. And to put that in perspective, 10 million square miles is roughly the size of Europe and China added together. So. I, I don't feel that archaeology can possibly say that it's got a complete grip on the human past, while 10 million square miles uh, that was habitable 21,000 years ago is not, now largely, not completely, but largely untouched by archaeology. I was pleased to see that some detailed survey work is being done on what's called dogger land between, between Great Britain and continental Europe. This area was above water during the last ice age. And, but but uh, the survey nevertheless goes in with the preconception that all they're going to find is evidence of primitive tribes there. And I don't think that we should go into any investigation with such a preconception. It may be possible that we'll find very surprising things, uh, as indeed uh, I, I did when Santa and I did, did this seven years of diving. We found a number of really intriguing underwater structures that were known to local fishermen, that were known to local divers, but were completely ignored by uh, archaeologists. And, and it's worth making the point that we have two other areas of the Earth's surface that have been very substantially underserved by archaeology. And one of those is the, the Sahara Desert, which was green during the Ice Age. 
Um, and the other is the Amazon rainforest, uh, which, is, which is an enormous, vast expanse, and I go into this in depth in America before, that is just beginning to reveal its mysteries, and that is revealing its mysteries because of modern economic pressures leading to clearances uh, of the rainforest. And those clearances are exposing uh, aspects of the cultural history of the Amazon, which we previously were completely completely unaware of and, and you know we still have an area roughly the size of the entire Indian subcontinent uh, within the Amazon rainforest which has just not been studied by archaeology at all so so actually archaeology it cannot in my view uh, claim to have the whole story on our past while so much of the world that was habitable 21,000 years ago um, is not investigated uh, today absolutely and um, we're going to get to the amazing finds that you came across in the Amazon, especially the DNA aspects, which are yeah. off the charts. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, since we're still talking about the diving, though, is you actually dove the Bimini Wall. The Bimini Road, yeah. The Bimini yeah. Road, yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, that's a very easy dive. Actually. Is it? Yeah, right. It's not it's, so far down. It's not so far. It's about 15, 20 feet. It's, oh, a, it's, it's, a, it's a very easy, relaxed, gentle dive with lots of lovely, friendly little nurse sharks down there, which, okay. don't, which don't eat you. You know, oh, that's you can, good. You can go yeah. play with them. And, <laughs> and, and, and then there's this extremely regular uh, pattern of uh, large blocks on the, on the seabed. And that pattern of large blocks uh, is the subject of a controversy. Uh, archaeologists believe it to be totally natural um, because they do not believe, um, given that it's been covered by water for thousands of years, they don't believe that any population was capable of creating a megalithic site on that scale. Um, perhaps not during the Ice Age, but say even eight or 10,000 years ago. Uh, and, and they therefore say it must be natural. Uh, it's, a na it's a natural site. Actually, I, I, I don't really care whether it's natural or man-made. Um, the, the fact is that that um, Bimini Road feature uh, is shown on an island above water on the Piri Reis map, which was drawn in 1513, uh, and, and which is based as Piri Reese himself tells us um, on more than 100 older source maps that had derived from the Library of Alexandria before it was burnt down. Uh, it, it puts an island right where the Bimini Road is, and it actually shows the Bimini Road on that island, except above water. And that says, that says somebody was mapping yeah. the world a long time before people are supposed to have been mapping, mapping the world. It's incredible, and um, you've given various, uh, you know, you've informed people about Charles Hapgood's work in your books. Charles Hapgood really did breakthrough work in a book called Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings, published in the 1960s. Uh, where he, he was really the first to document this anomalous category of maps that were... Uh, what's, what's confusing about the maps is that they were typically drawn in our era, between the 1300s and 1700s of our era. Um, but uh, the Piri Reis map is the best example because Piri Reis states it in his own handwriting on the map that it's based on more than 100 older source maps. Uh, this is the case with the other maps as well. They, they, they derive information from older source maps now lost. And they, in, in so doing, they incorporate certain puzzling features. They, they incorporate extremely precise relative longitudes. Uh, and that is something that we couldn't do until the end of the 18th century. So it's already a puzzle when on a map from 1513, you find extremely accurate longitudes. That's, you know... And he's, already, and he's saying it's older. Also. That's 250 years before we could do accurate longitudes. Yes. But then when you discover that that map is actually derived from much older source maps and contains features that show the world as it looked during the last ice age, then you have to consider the possibility that we're looking at a legacy of information contained in these maps and that that legacy must have come from a global seafaring and navigating civilization that had reached at least the level of navigational technology that our culture had achieved by the end of the 18th century, but during the Ice Age. Right. Uh, and that is, of course, an unacceptable idea to archaeology, but yeah. one that I feel is worth pursuing. And Charles Hapgood was the first to really put that on the record, and I'd, I'd highly recommend Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings to anybody who wants to look deeper into this fantastic, fantastic book. Well, what's remarkable about uh, Hapgood's other book on crustal displacement is that the introduction was done by 
Albert Einstein. The introduction was done by Albert Einstein, yeah. This yeah. is somebody who knew how to look at things differently. Yeah, this is extremely annoying to archaeologists as well. <laughs> how, how dare Albert Einstein <laughs> give an introduction to this politically incorrect book, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. how, which is how they, our, our archaeologists regard it. But Einstein gave that introduction because he was an open-minded man who kept yes. his, who, you know, who, who, who refused to be shut down and narrowed down, and he saw the potential in these ideas, and uh, you know, he, he, he put his words there and put himself on the record in support of Hapgood, and good, good for him. Yes, uh, it is remarkable. Um, the source of the maps, at least for Pierre Reese, where do you think the source of the maps came from? Well, Pierre Reese says that this, his source maps had been rescued from the library of Alexandria before it was burned down, and had been taken off to Constantinople, the city that we now call Istanbul, uh, where Piri Reis was, uh, was based, uh, and, and which uh, then was a very important city within the Roman Empire. So it makes sense that they would have been taken there. Uh, where had those maps come from originally, before they were archived in the Library of Alexandria? Well, uh, this, this brings me to my point. I think we're dealing with a lost civilization of the Ice Age. That's been my argument, uh, and all my work, pretty much all of it for the last 25 years. Few exceptions, I've written some novels. Yes. Um, I, I wrote a book called Supernatural about shamanism, but, but pretty much all of my other work has been focused on this issue of, of a lost civilization and uh, presenting the data and the evidence for it. And I, I see myself just as you do, as a, as a journalist, as a reporter. I do not see myself as a scientist. I do not see myself as a discoverer. Uh, I see myself as a reporter, uh, and if I'm doing anything useful, it's putting the pieces together uh, to, to see a bigger picture that, that would not be seen if the pieces are all kept separate and isolated uh, from, from one another. But I'm, I'm reporting evidence and information that is already out there in the field, but perhaps is not being paid enough attention to, or perhaps is lost in obscure academic journals. Uh, and perhaps has not been correlated with other information, which suddenly gives it much more, much more force. Um, so, for example, the discovery by the German Archaeological Institute of Gobekli Tepe in Turkey uh, was uh, an extremely important find, and, and one that has rather tended to validate arguments that I had put forward. It's not my achievement. I didn't discover Gobekli Tepe. Mm -hmm. The German Archaeological Institute uh, ex excavated it and um, lo and behold discovered that it's probably the largest megalithic site on Earth because most of it's still underground, although identified with ground penetrating radar, and that it dates to 11,600 years ago. Yes. Um, now that's, that's a really big problem for archaeology because 11,600 years ago, until the discovery of Gobekli Tepe, no one was supposed to have been able to create a massive megalithic site with a series of stone circles. There was a firm view in archaeology that such works could only be achieved by stable <coughs> and settled agricultural communities that had already formed themselves into towns or mini cities uh, that were creating food surpluses that allowed individuals to specialize on tasks like architecture or geometry or astronomy which in a hunter-gatherer society, according to this view, they would not be able to do. Uh, and so this is why a place like Malta, uh, with its amazing megalithic temples such, such as the Hypogeum and such as uh, Gigantia and Hagaim, uh, was, was felt to be evidence of this. It was felt that Malta uh, was a settled agricultural community, that they had the specialists, and this is how about 6,000 years ago they were able to begin to create these gigantic uh, megalithic sites. The problem then comes with Gobekli Tepe, which is at least 5,500 years older than that, which is set amongst what was prior to the construction of Gobekli Tepe, an entirely hunter-gatherer community. But during the construction and after the construction of Gobekli Tepe, it mysteriously became an agricultural community. Uh, and, and I just don't see that as a group of hunter-gatherers who, you know, woke up one morning magically equipped with the ability to create the largest megalithic site on Earth uh, with very precise astronomical and geometrical alignments, and at the same moment just invent, invented agriculture. I, I, to me, that looks much more like evidence for a transfer of technology 
that somebody came to that place who already knew about megalithic architecture and who already knew about agriculture and used the creation of that site and the mobilization of the population around that site as an instrument to pass on and transfer uh, skills, and, skills and knowledge. Uh, and I think that the more widely we are prepared to look, the more such sites we are going to uh, find. Santa and I went and investigated one of them at Karahan Tepe, just about 60 miles from Gobekli Tepe, where the same T-shaped megaliths are sticking out of the ground of a completely neglected hill in a farmer's backyard, you know. Uh, there, there are more sites like this, and that's the point, because uh, I, I want to pay tribute to John Anthony West, uh, who originally proposed Absolutely. He, John Anthony West is one of my heroes. Thank you for that shout out. Who originally proposed that the Sphinx is much older than 4,500 years ago and proposed this on the basis of the weathering and erosion patterns of the Sphinx and was able, and kudos to him, uh, was able to get the support of Dr. Robert Schock, professor of geology at Boston University, uh, in that erosion study to, to confirm that John was right and that the Great Sphinx is uh, indeed geologically uh, more like 12,000 years old. They had the evidence for and a half thousand years old. It's sort of, it's sort of weird. But the, the, but the critique of that from archaeologists was, look, the Sphinx can't possibly be 12,000 years old because there are no other major megalithic sites in the world that are 12,000 years old. And that's what Gobekli Tepe blows out of the water uh, because it is 11,600 years old, yes. which is you know right there in the same window. Uh, and it's an enormous megalithic site. And definitely, if you can make Gobekli Tepe, you can, you can make the Great Sphinx. So suddenly, we do have a context. And I think again and again, if archaeologists were prepared to look more widely, and if they were not, they did not get rigidly locked into a particular frame of reference, uh, that more and more evidence might, might be found. In, in uh, America before, I report the work of Dr. Tom Demeray at uh, the San Diego Natural History Museum. Uh, and his excavation of what is called the Ceruti Mastodon site. And the Ceruti Mastodon site uh, evidences human beings in America, specifically just south of San Diego, uh, 130,000 years ago. And that's twice as long as human beings have been in Europe, and it's twice as long as human beings have been in Australia. And it's 10 times as long as human beings were supposed to have been in the Americas. Until relatively recently, it was held as an object of faith by archaeologists that there had been no human beings in the Americas before 13,000 400 years ago. And suddenly we have Tom Demeray, very senior figure, chief paleontologist at the San Diego Natural History Museum, and a whole team of other researchers who you know, put their reputations on the line. A major paper published in Nature on the 26th of April 2017, documenting the presence of humans 130,000 years ago. And Tom Demeray's point is, well, um, he, was, he actually thought that archaeologists would be excited about this. But in fact, they were not. They were very upset about it and very angry about it. And the whole focus of archaeology, uh, since this discovery was published in Nature, the whole focus of archaeology has been to try to discredit the, 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 the discovery, to try to minimize it, to try to find any other way to explain the evidence that was found other than human presence. Um, and I get the case for destructive um, uh, treatment of new ideas. I, I, I understand that a new and radical idea deserves to face the fire of criticism, but I also think that it would be very, it would be very useful if, if archaeologists were to look at the other side of the story and consider, well, what, what actually would this imply if this were so? And what can we look at? What can we, what can we find that actually supports what has been said? Tom Demeray's point is that there were two episodes during the Ice Age uh, when it became feasible for the Americas to be peopled, uh, particularly by overland migrations across the Bering Straits, which were then a land bridge, and into Alaska, and thence into what is now Canada, and thence into the USA, and down south from there. And these two episodes uh, were uh, between about 140,000 years ago and 120,000 years ago, and then much more recently uh, around 13,000 
400 years ago, a much shorter episode of about 600 years at that time. And archaeologists have focused on that recent episode and have ignored the earlier episode when climate conditions also made peopling of the Americas possible. And Tom Demaray's find drops right into the middle of that earlier window of opportunity between 140 and 120,000 years ago. He, his find is dated to 130,000 years ago. And his point is that he would have hoped that the response of archaeologists would be to go dig in those deeper deposits, to go, you know, with archaeology, the deeper something is, the older it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the dogma, which was called Clovis first, which held that the Clovis, so-called Clovis culture were the first Americans, and that they'd arrived 13,400 years ago and then mysteriously vanished 12,800 years ago. That, that dogma was rigidly reinforced, uh, and, and archaeologists who challenged it and who sought to dig deeper like Jacques Saint Mars at Bluefish Caves in Canada, like Al Goodyear at Topper in South Carolina, uh, faced enormous censure from their colleagues and, and really quite vicious and radical attacks upon their integrity. Uh, and and um, it ruined their careers. And literally, literally ruined, ru ru ruined their careers. So those, those archaeologists who don't want to have their careers ruined uh, are pretty careful not to step into this kind of territory. Where, where other archaeologists will descend upon them like a pack of hyenas and, and uh, you know, ut utterly, or attempt to ut utterly destroy them. And Tom Demaray, as a paleontologist, wasn't quite prepared for this uh, archaeological ferocity. Um, he, he, he thought it would be really exciting to archaeologists that he'd found this evidence uh, and that their response might be to go dig deeper in a few places uh, and look at those, those older deposits and see, and see what is in there. And that's part of my point in this book, that because of archaeological dogma, about 100,000 years of American prehistory has simply not been studied. It's not been, it's not been ignored. And now, yes, most archaeologists will admit Clovis was not first. There were human beings here before. The new evidence has reached the point where it overwhelms the old paradigm. But, but in the process of doing so, uh, many archaeological careers were ruined. Uh, and, and, and information that the public deserved to know was suppressed. And uh, this, to my mind, is not good scholarship. It's not helpful. Because they were right at the wrong time. They were right at the wrong time. You put it exactly correctly. That's, that's, that's the problem. Um, these days, it's, uh, it's a bit easier. But as Tom Demery's example shows, not that easy. Um, yeah. There's a massive resistance to the idea of a very early peopling of the Americas. I'm not even sure why. Um, it's, just that, it's just that it kind of got set in stone at some point. Well, your book, you're kind of a heretic in a sense. <laughs> that, yes, I suppose so. That's, that's um, you know, everybody has a role. And my, my, my role appears to have been to um, write and publish heresy uh, over, <laughs> over the last 25 years Absolutely. or so, uh, particularly, particularly archaeological heresy uh, concerning, concerning the past of the human species. And I just feel, I just feel that, that, that this is a really important matter. We are all hu human beings, you know, and we want to know where we came from and what our story is and what the whole background is. And the more voices that are brought to this inquiry, the, 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 the better, in my view. We shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't have a rigid bureaucracy that shuts down inquiry or closes off other avenues of investigation. Uh, in the way that in the way that archaeology has 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 done, so I think there's a role for the heretic mm -hmm. uh, in in all fields, actually. Yeah. Uh, and it may be very uncomfortable to be a heretic sometimes, uh, and and you may face um, all kinds of attacks on your name and on your reputation, but I think it provides a useful service uh, that ultimately it shakes things up, and it gets people thinking. Of course, the heresy does need to be. Documented, yes. you know, there's no point in just saying I, I think stuff wasn't like this. I think it was like that You have to say why you think it was like that and that's why there's 1,500 footnotes in my book you know? right, exactly. It's a remarkable book in the sense of how many different scientific minds you draw together. Yeah for it and different disciplines. Yes um, And the book I think is such a breakthrough uh, So let's get into some of the heresy of it the Native Americans and the Egyptians they have something in common. Well, they do. Um, and this, uh, this becomes evident at a site called Moundville in Alabama. Um, let me see how to best put this. The ancient Egyptians were a culture that claimed they had received a legacy of knowledge from the gods. It's, it's very striking how much about ancient Egypt 
is at its best at the very beginning uh, and then tends to decline. And their explanation for this was that all their knowledge, all their wisdom, all their skill was a, was, was a, was a legacy. And part of this legacy is a system of, of spiritual ideas about what happens to us when we die. Uh, and and um, there, are very, there are very specific symbols and iconography within, within this system of ideas that the soul must ascend to the constellation of Orion, which the ancient Egyptians typified as the god of resurrection and rebirth, Osiris, must pass through the constellation of Orion to the banks of the Milky Way. Orion is situated on the bank of the Milky Way. Uh, and then must make a journey along the Milky Way uh, there to answer for the life that he or she has lived. Uh, you were given a precious opportunity to be born in a human body. What did you do with it? Did you use it well? Or did you squander it? These are the fundamental questions that are asked on that journey and they're manifested through certain confrontational figures uh, often monstrous serpents, for example, that were, will encounter the soul of the deceased on the way and challenge the soul. Well, it turns out that the same set of ideas, the leap to the constellation of Orion, the passage through a, a portal in the constellation of Orion, which has been identified, it's the Orion Nebula, beneath the three stars of Orion's belt, uh, the access to the Milky Way, a journey along the Milky Way, which in the Mississippi Valley was called the Path of Souls, the trials and ordeals that are confronted by the soul on that path. Just every single detail uh, is the same, uh, in, 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 w w with extraordinary regularity. Orion was not figured as a man in the sky in the Mississippi Valley. It was figured as a human hand with the fingers pointed downwards and with the, the portal in the, in the palm of the hand and the belt stars forming the forming the wrist. Um, but apart from, apart from that, the fundamental concepts are, are identical. Uh, and this is, uh, in my view, too much to be a coincidence. And it's also too much, particularly since we find it manifested most, uh, most fully at Moundville. Um, it's also too much to be explained by some kind of ancient Egyptian missionary expedition to Native America in historic times. Because the plain fact is that ancient Egypt had been dead and gone as a civilization for 600 years before Moundville was created. There was no seeding of ideas directly from the Nile Valley to Moundville. Those ideas must have been inherited in the Mississippi Valley, just as they were inherited in ancient Egypt. And that's the conclusion I come to, is that what we're looking at is not evidence for direct contact, between the Mississippi Valley and the Nile Valley in historic times, but evidence for a legacy of knowledge that was passed down in both places from a remote third party civilization. In other words, from a lost civilization. Mm -hmm. And since the Americas have effectively been, were effectively cut off uh, by sea level rise at the end of the last ice age, were effectively cut off from the Asian landmass. Uh, from about 11,600 years ago until the time of Columbus, uh, we, we must conclude that the legacy is older than 11,600 years ago, uh, that, it, that, it, uh, that it dates back uh, before the time that I call the, se the separation of peoples, uh, that it's a legacy that goes back to, to the last ice age. Um, and and uh, this is found actually all over uh, the Mississippi Valley. Uh, the, the, the origin of sites in the Mississippi Valley goes back much further than Moundville. But the specific iconography related to Orion and the Milky Way is very much associated with Moundville. And the key point there is Moundville was made 600 years after the last of ancient Egypt had, had vanished from the story. I don't know, maybe ancient Egyptians did come to America at some time. Maybe Vikings came here. Maybe Phoenicians came here as well. Maybe Romans came here. I wouldn't rule it out, but they didn't make a lasting impact. They did not leave a genetic fingerprint uh, here, here in the Americas. If, if, if small groups of people came across on boats and had some contact with ancient America, uh, that uh, is not sufficient to account for the vast uh, amount of similarity and detail 
in these systems. And it's the same focus on the mystery of what happens to us after death. Uh, and it's a focus that in our society we prefer to avoid and not think about. Or hive off to the mainstream religions who simply tell us what to think in, 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 in this respect. The message both of the Mississippi Valley and of ancient Egypt is that some aspect of the individual definitely does survive death uh, and that we will be held accountable for the lives that we've led and that that accounting will take place on a journey uh, that we have to undergo. Amazing. Um, this is the scientific materialism creeping into the culture that if you can't weigh it, you can't measure it, it's not there. Um, and so it leaves us with a real deficit when we're coming to look at these issues or the cosmologies of these cultures. It leaves, it leaves us with a huge deficit. Look, I mean, the, the issue of the journey of the soul uh, and the identical nature of that in ancient Egypt and in the Mississippi Valley isn't confined to there. Uh, if you go down to the Amazon, you're going to find very similar ideas uh, connected to the consumption of ayahuasca, uh, the vine of souls or the vine of the dead, uh, and again, the afterlife realm and the afterlife journey of the soul uh, being encountered through direct experience rather than necessarily through teachings or, or written scriptures. Um, you're going to find enormous earthworks in the Amazon that are pretty much identical to the earthworks in the Mississippi Valley. You're going to find that those earthworks are classic henges. A henge is um, uh, a ditch with an external embankment, uh, the whole thing made of, made of earth. Uh, so everybody's heard of Stonehenge. Yes. Um, the, the henge bit of that is the earthwork. Uh, Avery, near where I live, is another henge. Um, the enormous sites that are emerging from the Amazon rainforest are true henges, earthwork sites, with a large embankment outside the ditch rather than inside. That's why we know they don't have anything to do with defense, you know, yes. because if your embankment is a wall, then you're going to put your moat outside the wall, not, mm -hmm. not inside the wall. Right. Um, and and uh, re really the, 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 the intriguing thing is that in all of these places, the same kind of architecture, whether it's the henges of Europe, whether it's the Great Pyramid of Giza, whether it's the, the henges and earthworks of the Amazon, whether it's the giant pyramid of Cahokia uh, in, uh, in Illinois, uh, that they're all connected to the same set of ideas about the, the journey of the soul after death. And, this to me suggests a remotely ancient origin for those ideas and that we're just looking at the leavings and the traces of it in these, in these historical cultures. Absolutely. Um, when you have looked at these various mythologies and histories, is there any reason why it's Orion? Well, that's an interesting point, Daniel. I mean, Orion, well, first of all, it's a very striking, it's a very striking constellation yes. which stands out in the sky pretty much everywhere. Uh, in, in, in the world. It's hard to miss it. Um, although different cultures construe its appearance in, in slightly different ways, it's the same, it's the same constellation. Um, the reason why Orion, I, I, think, uh, we, I think we are looking at a very ancient system of religious ideas which used powerful symbolism to focus the mind uh, on the mysteries of life after death. And I think that Orion and the Milky Way uh, were deliberately selected uh, as symbolic items on that on that journey. You know, they, it's not an accident that there's a narrow shaft cut through the southern side of the Great Pyramid that points directly at the lowest of the, the three stars of Orion's belt. The, the 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 connection is obviously a very important one. We could get more mystical and woo woo, you know, okay. when it comes to the issue of yeah. of that portal in the palm of the hand constellation as Orion was seen in the Mississippi Valley, and it's association with the, with the Orion Nebula. There may be mysteries beyond mysteries here, but what, what I can say is that at some point, and it has to be during the Ice Age, it has to be before 11,600 years ago, some group of people put together a very coherent system of spiritual ideas with very specific notions about what happens to us after death and relating those to specific bits of the sky uh, and that these ideas were then passed down all around the world. It's fascinating, and that's a fascinating legacy. Um, when we get these ideas and they come back to us, and you look at something like you spent all this time at the Serpent Mound in Ohio, um, this culture, how does this culture apprehend what they were trying to tell us? Well, first of all, a recommendation, go see Serpent Mound. 
summer solstice is coming up, twentieth, twenty first of June. That's the that's the time to be there. Uh, that's the time when that amazing earthwork speaks to the sky, communicates and interlocks directly with the with the sky. What's rather fascinating about Serpent Mound is, and it, again, it suggests an ancient worldwide system of ideas. What you actually have at Serpent Mound is a natural ridge. Uh, and the head, if you like, the head end of that ridge uh, is oriented pretty much to the position where the sun sets on the summer solstice. Now, this was clearly recognized by the ancients. It was clearly recognized because then they came along and they did something to that ridge. They, they, they didn't just leave it as a natural ridge. They built this beautiful 1,400 foot long serpent on top of it with a spiral tail and then a series of coils leading up to the open jaws of the serpent. And the dead center line through the open jaws targets the setting point of the sun on the summer solstice. Um, what's fascinating, and again, I, I documented in America before, uh, is that we've discovered only recently that the same enhancement of a natural alignment uh, also took place at Stonehenge uh, in, in Britain. See, for a long time it was held that uh, it was mysterious that all the stones of Stonehenge had been brought from elsewhere. The, the very big ones, which can weigh up to 20 or 30 tons, which are called sarsens, are thought to have been brought from the Marlborough Downs, which is about 20 miles away from Salisbury Plain, where Stonehenge is. And the smaller ones, the blue stones, were thought to have been brought from Wales. Um, and and the, the, question, the big question that a lot of archaeologists ask themselves is why didn't they just build Stonehenge on the Marlborough Downs, where the Sarsons lie about in plenty? Why did they build it 20 miles away? But what was discovered recently is that two of those sarsens were actually in position at Stonehenge all the time. Uh, and those two sarsens, uh, sarsens are sarsen stone 16 and the heel stone. And they line up perfectly to target the rising point of the sun on the summer solstice. Uh, this was clearly recognized. This is nature, earth, speaking to sky. It was clearly recognized by the ancients. And they then memorialized the whole site by bringing all the other sarsens from Marlborough Downs and the Blue Stones and creating Stonehenge, as we know it today, built around that natural alignment. So the same thing is at Serpent Mound, that the Earth was already speaking to sky. And human, human beings then took it further and created this beautiful mound site on top of it and very carefully targeted it to the summer solstice uh, sunrise. This is the Yardang. Uh, well, I did the Yardang theory of the Sphinx. Yes. I mean, the, 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 the argument, of, of course, concerning the Sphinx is that it was a, a natural formation at one point. Which, and there are many lion-like natural formations called Yardangs in Egypt's western desert, which have been shaped by erosion over thousands of years. And the suggestion is that this is what the Sphinx was, uh, and that it was a Yardang that was oriented to the equinox sunrise. Uh, and that this was recognized by the ancients, and they then carved it into the shape of a lion. Uh, and I and my colleagues, Robert Baval and I in particular, have long made the case that it was made the shape of a lion because of the constellation of Leo, right. which lay behind the sun at the spring equinox, roughly in the period from 12,800 to 11,600 years ago. But you're right, again, it's the same theme. Uh, let's find a place where earth and sky are already in sacred communion. And then let's celebrate that. Let's create a beautiful monument uh, on that site. Let's add human ingenuity and cre creativity uh, to the picture that, that, it, that emerges there. And then something magical happens. And this, this idea is found widely distributed all, all around the world. And I think it goes back to a remote common origin. There is a, uh, so, but just to say yes. on Serpent Mound, it, it, it really it truly is a magical place. Uh, and and n nobody should miss the opportunity of going there, and particularly of going there at the summer solstice. Um, to really see it, you need to do what we did. My wife, Santh, is a photographer, and she brought a drone, and we put that drone 400 feet above Serpent Mound, so that you can actually see the sun and the head of the serpent in the same shot. Uh, and you can see how amazing and beautiful this alignment is. And, and you have to ask yourself, how did the ancients conceive of that, even though they understood that it was pointing at the direction of the summer solstice sunset. How did they understand that? How could it be seen from above in that, in, in, in that way? Because that's the only place that you really get the full view of it when you situ situate yourself in a drone yes. 400 feet above it. 
Well, we've had this before with the Nazca lines, yeah. which is it's very unexplainable mm. because they didn't have flight, obviously. Yeah, so it, it poses a problem. And yet they were able to create these monuments on, on, an, on an enormous scale. You yeah. mentioned uh, the photographs with the drone and uh, Santa, the, the incredible photographs in the book are remarkable and really bring your time there mm. home, I think, through those images. So they're yeah. just remarkable. Um, a few things about the Serpent Mound, um, its connection to the solstice and the concept of the Manitou. The Serpent Mound is a, is a Manitou, and a Manitou ultimately is a, is a natural phenomenon uh, which may be enhanced by human activity, which has enormous innate power and resonance that, uh, that, that, that speaks to us. You, you, you sense its uh, almost divine attributes, that it's, a, that it's almost a living creature, uh, and at the same time, a work, of, a work of nature. And the Serpent Mound is a classic Manitou uh, in serpent form, uh, connecting earth and sky uh, in, in, in that way. And, and uh, this is a concept, of course, that's widely distributed in Native America. It's remarkable, um, and it seemed to me, when I was looking at the Serpent Mound, I was thinking of Kukulkan and Quetzalcoatl and Feathered Feather Serpent. serpent yeah. um, so there's that serpent again, and here in this one his jaws are open. Yeah, serpents, uh, serp serpents everywhere. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, you know, one could go, one could go into, into all sorts of reasons uh, for, for that. There's a, there's a very interesting oval earthwork immediately in front of the open jaws of the, of, of, of the serpent. And some researchers have recently drawn attention to the similarity of that oval earthwork to the Carolina Bays. This is not my work, but mm -hmm. it's, it's, the, it's the work of, of, of others, Michael Davias, for example. Fascinating. Um, and and uh, there has long been an argument about whether the Carolina Bays are connected to uh, comet uh, impacts, uh, which is another theme that I explore in, in some depth in this book. Absolutely. Um, it's interesting because, of course, the Serpent Mound is in a comet. Serpent Mound is already in, a, in an impact crater. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that Much older. But, but the, it, is a, it is an impact crater. And that place on the, on the horizon where the sun sets, that's one of the outer rings of the impact crater. They seem to know that, to put the sacred site there somehow. There's, there seems to be knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Definitely. Absolutely fascinating. Um, the, uh, it's a cosmic impact crater. Yeah. That's, that's literally where it was. Yes. Like. Quite remarkable. It's called the Serpent Mound Crypto Explosive Structure. <laughs> that's a great name. You, um, what was the most remarkable thing that you saw when you were there? Because it seemed to me that you were moved by it. And it's funny because in the book, I mentioned this to you, that parts of it you write like a travelogue, which I thought was kind of unique. Uh, in this book, and it made it so approachable that it's not just a lot of archaeological facts. Well, my first ever book was a travel book. It was called Journey Through Pakistan. Yes. You know, it was published in 1981. There we go. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I, I think it's, in, it's, it's, it's important to uh, be a traveler and, and, and write as such, and that's, that's what I've tried to do uh, over the years. But what moved me most about Serpent Mound? Yes. Yeah apart from the magical connection of earth and sky that is uh, sacralized there, was the people who come there, people who come there from all over the world, who are drawn to that site uh, to celebrate that magical moment. Uh, Serpent Mound is not a dead effigy. Serpent Mound is speaking to the modern world. Uh, and and uh, there are communities within the modern world that are responding to it. The big way and measure and count communities of mainstream materialist science are not responding to it. Um, but there is, a, there is a new mood uh, afoot in the world today where people are questioning everything and, and are open once again to the, to the possibility that the ancients have much to teach us. See, that's one of the mistakes of our civilization is our, our arrogance and our conceit and our pride and our mistaken belief that the whole historical process has been about us uh, and that we're the pinnacle uh, of all of this. And we tend to look down on earlier cultures as in some way inferior uh, to our own. What I'm seeing all around the world, particularly amongst the younger generation, uh, is, is a recognition that there is great wisdom in the ancient cultures mm -hmm. and that they have something to teach us and maybe even something that can save us from, from ourselves from the technological nightmare, the robotic 
highly controlled uh, mind games that are played within our society, that, that maybe there's wisdom there that can, that can uh, save us from that mess that we're presently marching into. Yeah, or we're, we're hurtling at fast speed, kind of like a comet towards our fate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which, which, which can only be stopped by, by, by sovereign individuals taking command of their own consciousness and thinking for themselves. Uh, and by and, and by refusing to be told what to think, uh, this is this is that the time for that has passed, when politicians, scientists, commercial leaders had the power and the authority to tell us what to think. They may imagine they still have that power and authority, but they don't. Uh, and times are changing very very rapidly. Um, and that was one of the things that came home very forcefully to me at uh, Serpent Mound was, was this international gathering there. People recognizing this place matters, this place speaks to us, this place can in some intangible way uh, cha change our lives. Amazing, and that's an awareness that's building and it was just sort of palpable when you were there. It's, defi it's definitely building. I've, I've, been, I've been conscious of this for, for, se for several years. I suppose I, I got into it over my my intense opposition to the uh, war on drugs, mm -hmm. um, which, I, which I believe to be one of the most evil and wicked crimes that has ever been inflicted upon humanity. Uh, because because uh, what the war on drugs is doing is saying that sovereign adults are not capable of making responsible decisions about their own health and their own bodies. Uh, and that cannot possibly be right. And I see, I see more and more people today who actually are saying, no, it's not right that the government should tell me what I may or may not put into my own body and should punish me with, with criminal sanctions uh, if I disobey the law. So kudos to the citizens of Massachusetts for voting for the legalization it of It finally cannabis. happened, yeah. It finally happened, and what's, it, what's exciting about it, what's, what's exciting about it is it's a citizen's initiative. It's from the ground up. It's not big government saying, okay, this is what you're going to do now. It's people taking their power back into their own hands. And this issue is, has, ne has not been typified enough in the way that it should be. This is the, the heart of this issue is not getting high or getting stoned or you know, being whatever the ideology of the war on drugs says that that involves. That's not the heart of the issue. The heart of the issue is the right of adults to make decisions about their own health their own bodies and their own consciousness without reference to any government agency. And that is a fundamental human right. And if we are not free to make those decisions about our own bodies and our own health and our own consciousness, then any talk we have about freedom is complete and utter bullshit, completely meaningless. There is no freedom when there is no freedom of consciousness. And that's why this obnoxious thing called the war on drugs is so, so wrong. And it fails completely even in its own terms because it does not stop people from taking dangerous and harmful drugs. The best way to do that is to have genuine, reliable information out there, and then people will make up their own minds in a responsible way, just as the vast majority of people have made up their own minds about smoking cigarettes. Nobody was ever sent to jail for smoking cigarettes. Nobody ever had their job taken away or their life ruined. Nobody had to do a urine test for nicotine, okay? But the fact is, that a great majority of people who were smokers 20 or 30 years ago are not smokers today because they've seen the information and they've made the responsible adult decision. And I suggest it's the same with all drugs and that the war on drugs was in fact invented to empower enormous armed bureaucracies uh, which control our lives in all kinds of ways. And if we accept that government may tell us what to do with our health and our consciousness and our bodies, then we're going to accept everything else that government tells us as well. Absolutely. So I see a wonderful change taking place in the younger generation who are literally refusing to put up with this crap any longer and are thinking for themselves and taking initiatives and actions for themselves. And has Massachusetts fallen to pieces since cannabis was legalized? I don't think so. So far, so good. I don't think so. Uh, has you know California fallen to pieces? This, this was the ideology of the war on drugs. If we legalize drugs, these societies will completely collapse. California seems to be doing pretty well to me. So does Washington State. So does 
Oregon, you know, so does Colorado, who've now, just while I was there, uh, decriminalized the use of psilocybin Amazing. as well. Colorado is leading free thinking in this, in this respect. You know, we have to move into a world where we start thinking for ourselves and stop accepting dogma that's been passed down to us through our religions and through bureaucratic figures. And if we don't do that, then we're just meat robots and there's no point to us at all. Yes, yeah, absolutely, wow. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Graham, before we go into the Amazon, where you've made these incredible discoveries uh, and the DNA aspects there, off the charts, um, since you're talking about this subject, you of course uh, have done a lot of writing and a lot of investigation, a lot of personal experience with shamanic uh, consciousness, psychedelic experience. Mm -hmm. um, in relation to your work, how does it influence your work? Oh, it's, in, it's influenced my work in, in, in enormously. My, my, my particular relationship has been with ayahuasca yes. uh, in, in, in the form of the beverage that is made in the Amazon jungle, uh, and, and also to some extent uh, with smoked and vaped uh, dimethyltryptamine, uh, DMT. Well, um, the experiences that I've had with these substances over, over, over the years um, have, first of all, uh, taught me that I must work harder to be a better human being and to be more nurturing and more helpful to others around me um, and given me that lesson very clearly. I'm not saying that I always act on that lesson, but uh, I've, 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 I've received that lesson. And, and secondly, uh, opened up to me with great clarity the notion that I am not my body, that the ancient ideas of the soul uh, are, are worthy and, and important ideas, and they cannot be confined simply to a trip to paradise or hell. It's much more complicated than that. Um, and, and, and thirdly, that the ancients were filled with wisdom. Uh, ayahuasca itself is an example of that, uh, because, because ayahuasca is a combination of two different Amazonian plants. One of them is a vine, and one of them is a shrub. The shrub contains, the leaves contain dimethyltryptamine, um, but dimethyltryptamine is not normally orally active. Uh, you, we experience in the West by smoking it or vaping it. Um, but they made it orally active in the Amazon by cooking the leaves of that shrub, which is called chacruna, with the ayahuasca vine. Uh, the, the reason is that there's an enzyme in the gut called monoamine oxidase that switches off DMT on contact. The ayahuasca vine contains a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. Uh, and, and, you know, I have to ask, how could this be done out of 150,000 different species of plants and trees and vines in the Amazon? How did they isolate these two, neither of which in an oral form are psychoactive on their own? They only work when put together. This to me looks like, uh, looks like evidence of scientific reasoning uh, in the Amazon a very, very, very long time ago. Yes, yes, fascinating. Um, before we go to the Amazon, there's a, something very unusual I found in the book, and I wanted to get these terms right. It has something to do with a Native American female figure called the Brain Smash. The Brain Smasher, <laughs> yes. Well, this, this, was, this was again, again, there are multiple examples in, in the book, and we can't go into all of them here, but when I'm comparing the ancient Mississippi Valley uh, notions of the afterlife journey of the soul and the ancient Egyptian notions of the afterlife journey of the soul. Uh, it's indeed the case that in the Mississippi Valley there is a female figure called the brain smasher or the brain taker. Uh, and her, what she does is she literally smashes out the brains of the damned, of, of unworthy souls who've lived vicious and cruel lives, who've not helped others, but who've hurt and hindered and harmed others, they get their brains smashed out on the afterlife journey. Um, and it's fascinating that, that in the ancient Egyptian book of what is in the Duat, uh, which describes the afterlife journey of the soul as the ancient Egyptians conceived it, uh, I came across a vignette which shows uh, a goddess with her hands stretched out to the figure of a man who's kneeling before her, uh, and he is smashing out his own brains with a hatchet. Uh, that, uh, that was simply described by the translator of the book, but the translator did not actually translate the hieroglyphs relating to the role of that goddess. 
So I had an expert in hieroglyphs at the British Museum translate those specific hieroglyphs. And lo and behold, it turns out that that role of that goddess is to smash out the brains of the dead. Wow. Uh, exactly as Remarkable. is the case in, in, in the Native American system. And that's why I feel we can't account for this with coincidence. There's too much of it. There's too, there's too many examples that it, at a certain point it becomes crazy to suggest that it's coincidence and more reasonable to suggest that there's some kind of remote common origin at the, at the heart common of Common origin. Uh, the lost civilization, traditional archaeology will hold Sumeria was the birthplace of civilization. History begins at Sumer. Yes. That's the title of the book. That's, that's, that has been dogma in archaeology for a very long time. Uh, and again, you know, they're going to have to look at all that uh, with, with fresh eyes uh, in, 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 in the future. But uh, the radical proposition I'm making in this book is that it's possible that actually civilization as we know it originated in the Americas, yes. not, uh, not at all uh, in the old world, that the old world came to its second rather than first, that it was here first, uh, and that after the cataclysm of the Younger Dryas between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago, it was transferred from the mm -hmm. Americas to many other parts of the world, including parts of the Americas. Remarkable. And that story uh, has often been given the title Atlantis. Yes. And Plato gave the name Atlantis. Yes. The name Atlantis comes from Plato, uh, from the, the Timias and Critias dialogues. Um, we know how Plato got the story of Atlantis. Uh, we know that he got it through his ancestral family line, uh, through the Greek lawmaker Solon, who visited Egypt in 600 BC and was there told the story of Atlantis by the priests of a temple at Sais in the Delta that was dedicated to the goddess Neith. That temple no longer exists. Um, but uh, they pointed to writings on the walls of the temple and they told Solon that these were, this was the story of a great civilization called Atlantis that had been destroyed in an enormous flood cataclysm. Um, and uh, when Solon asked them when did this happen, they said 9,000 years ago. Uh, and that was in 600 BC. So that means they're actually giving us a date that we can relate to. That's 9,600 BC. And the point about it is that 9,600 BC is the end of the Younger Dryas. And it's accompanied by a massive rise in sea levels, nominated by geologists as Meltwater Pulse 1b. Uh, and, and the notion that archaeologists prefer that Plato made the whole story up is seriously questioned by the dating he gives us, which coincides with the latest geological information on enormous sea level rise at the end of the last ice age. And it's important to be clear that Plato is the sole surviving original source that yes. we have for Atlantis. Right. That all other sources are either channeled or uh, derivative mm -hmm. of Plato. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, Plato does need to be taken seriously in this respect. And it's the fact that he gives us that date and that we know that it, it coincides with an enormous rise in sea level uh, that, that I find particularly intriguing. Amazing. Uh, it's an amazing foundation. Um, when he is talking about where it is, he is looking across the Atlantic. Plato very specifically says that it's an enormous island uh, that lies to the west of the Pillars of Hercules, uh, which are the Straits of Gibraltar. Yes. Um, and if you want to find a really enormous island that lies to the west of the Straits of Gibraltar, you're looking at America. Yes, absolutely. You're looking at the Americas, uh, which is essentially a one huge, huge island. Um, lying, lying there in the Atlantic Ocean, exactly where Plato said we should be looking. You know, it's fascinating, and this is what's so uh, intriguing about the book, and why I think it, it upsets history so much, because you know, we're talking about traditional archaeology, and it begins in Sumer and all the rest of it. The Atlantis story kind of sits there in the middle of that, disrupting that whole pattern, because yeah, it, it suggests there's something much older. It does. It, it, it's heresy yes. from the point of view of archaeology. How, how dare Plato suggest that there was a civilization that was destroyed 11,600 years ago, and God knows how long it existed before, before that. That's a very annoying idea to archaeologists, and that's why they consistently seek to diminish and downplay Plato and suggest that he's giving us some kind of political analogy uh, and that it's not a true history at all. Uh, and they, they, they don't consider the possibility that he may be using that true history uh, in order to make a political point. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, rather, I rather do the same myself, um, because uh, I, I don't think it's impossible that we are going to be the next lost civilization. 
Uh, and and uh, if we do not wish to be the next lost civilization, then we need to listen to the voices of the past and, and make certain changes. No question about it. Um, if we face that great comet explosion that they faced there in that period somewhere 13,000 years ago, um, our culture would be eliminated. My view, my view is that Western industrialized civilization, not just say Western, industrialized civilization in toto, it's all one thing all around the world, uh, would not survive such, such a cataclysm because we don't have survival skills and we're, we're very specialized and very dependent on the specialisms of, of others. We all contribute our little bit to the overall picture but we're not in command of the, of the overall picture. And if you have a major disruptive cosmic event like further comet impacts, uh, which, which, are, which are by no means impossible, uh, then uh, our, our civilization would not make it through. We're, we're not psychologically prepared to survive a cataclysm on that nature. Uh, and those who are psychologically prepared are, are the simplest people in the world, are the hunter-gatherers, those who do not have elaborate technological cultures, those who are daily in the business of survival. They would be the ones who survive, and they're exactly the ones who Plato says survived the last cataclysm, that it wasn't the advanced citizens of Atlantis who survived, it was the shepherds and the herdsmen in the mountains who survived, and they, had no let they didn't have letters. And that's why we all have to begin again like children, with no memory of what went before. Uh, and I make the case, and I think, uh, I, I, I think it is the case, that a very strong effort was made to pass down a memory of these events uh, and to pass a warning to the future. I don't want to get all kind of doom and gloom over this. But right. The, but the, you the, avoid that. Uh, and we've not, gone into, well. we've not gone into detail about the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis, yes. which, which I set out at full length in this book. Um, but it's the work of more than 60 major scientists. And their argument, compellingly put in very major peer-reviewed journals, such as the Journal of Geology or the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, not largely read by the general public, but their argument very coherently put is that the Earth was hit 12,800 years ago by multiple fragments of a disintegrating comet, that there were further impacts 11,600 years ago, and that these account both for the beginning and the end uh, of, the, of, of the Younger Dryas, and that these impacts are traced to a giant comet, uh, which may have had a diameter of more than 100 miles, that entered the inner solar system about 20,000 years ago on an Earth-crossing orbit. Uh, for the next few thousand years, not much damage was done. Uh, the Earth and the comet missed each other, but comets always break up into multiple fragments. And as they do, a meteor stream is formed. And the meteor stream that was formed by this disintegrating comet is called the Torrid Meteor Stream. Uh, and we still pass through it twice every year. Uh, and there are still extremely large objects, which are fragments of the original giant comet within the Torrid Meteor Stream which is now 30 million kilometers wide. Each passage takes 12 and a half days in June and again in November. And the scientists working on this have just very recently, just in the last few weeks, published a new paper pointing out that this June, we are going to be coming very, as close as we've been for a very long time to the core of the Torrid meteor stream. Uh, and that this represents a tremendous observational opportunity to, to calculate the real dangers that the Torrid meteor stream represents to us. And when I say I don't want to spread gloom and doom, it's because there is a problem there, and we can do something about it, should we choose to do so. It's, it's not an insoluble problem. It's a problem within our capacity to solve. But if we can continue to deny that there's any problem at all, or if we prefer, as we do at present, to devote most of our resources to warfare and weapons of mass destruction, then we're never going to get to grips with that problem. And, and we could indeed become the next lost civilization. It would indeed be the hunter-gatherers who we coexist with in the world today, in the Amazon jungle, in, in the Namibian desert, for example. It would be their descendants who would carry the human story forward. Amazing. It would happen all over again. And they would tell a myth of how there was once a great civilization on this planet, which uh, fell out of harmony with the universe and got destroyed. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. Absolutely. Um, when you think about NASA, and they did this recent simulation of destroying one of these comets, and by accident, they to save uh, 
I think it was to save New York. They, no, to save Denver, they destroyed New York. Yeah, the, the, the idea was to blow the comet up or blow bits off yes. it. And, and one of those bits hit New York and destroyed it in the simulation. In light of your work in here, did you find that well, I found it unnerving? I found it spooky because, yeah. because NASA has, has consistently and doggedly over the last 20 years denied that there's any cosmic danger at all. And suddenly it's wargaming a cosmic impact. Um, and and uh, if you follow the headlines over the last four or five years, we've had more and more near misses with asteroids and comets. And, and um, I, think it's, I think it's worth paying attention to because when, when, these incident, when a big enough object comes in through the Earth's atmosphere and hits the Earth at tens of thousands of kilometers per hour, uh, you have, by definition, a, a giant cataclysm. Uh, and, and we don't want that to happen. We don't want to become, you know, the dinosaurs made extinct by a cosmic impact. We would like the human family to go on. Yes. And we'd like our children and our children's children to have a beautiful garden of a planet to live upon. Uh, and we're doing so many things wrong in terms of, of, of ensuring that at the moment. Many, many things wrong. But one of the things we're doing wrong is not paying attention to immediate and near dangers in our immediate cosmic environment. Uh, that we could pay attention to and, and we could divert should we choose to do so. It seems like they're more willing to talk about it suddenly. Yeah. What you don't want to do is blow the thing up though. That's, that's, um, yeah. that's not good because, because then you get this sort of shotgun blast instead of you know, the single right. large artillery round. Um, <laughs> right, and, exactly. and, and the shotgun blast can be just as bad or even, or even worse. What you, want, what you want to do is to nudge it and move it. Mm. Uh, and that's, and that's, that's doable should we choose to apply our technology to a positive end rather than applying it to negative ends or ends that are purely to do with you know, consumption and material wealth. Yeah, absolutely. It's fascinating. And this is the period that we're in where we have to consider these things. It's like we're staring in a mirror at this last period of destruction it, and ways to avoid the similar It's a very fate. It's a very odd thing. I've made this point in many previous books that there's a phenomenon called precession. Uh, and it's, it's caused by a wobble on the axis of the Earth. Uh, the Earth is the viewing platform from which we observe the stars. So changes in its orientation in space alter the rising times and the positions of stars in the sky as, as viewed from the Earth. And it's a cycle. So it unfolds, the complete cycle takes 25,920 years to unfold. Um, and it's just interesting to me that we're halfway around that cycle now from the time of the Younger Dryas impacts 12,800 years ago. We're, we're, we're almost exactly halfway around that cycle. If you multiply 12,800 by two, you get to, uh, I think, 25,600. 25, yeah. Yes. Which is just, uh, you know, a fraction of that 25,920 that, uh, that is the precessional cycle. Yes. And which unfolds at the rate of one degree every 72 years. And, and where there are enormous numbers of monuments around the world that have these numbers incorporated into them. So that the Great Pyramid is a scale model of the northern hemisphere of the Earth on a scale of one to 43,200. 43,200 is one of those numbers that's derived from precession of the equinoxes. It's 600 times 72. Um, the height of the Great Pyramid multiplied by 43,200 gives you the polar radius of the Earth, and the base perimeter of the Great Pyramid multiplied by 43,200 gives you the equatorial circumference of the Earth. Um, and, 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 you know, Egyptologists say that's a co coincidence. Um, it's remarkable. <laughs> but, and, and maybe if the scale was 1 to 57,820 or 1 to 36,240, which would also give you a big monument, uh, it, it, maybe if the scale was that, it, it could be a coincidence. But, but this, it's not. It's, it's not a random number. It's a highly significant number. So we have a monument that targets the north, the, the, the true north pole of the Earth within 3 sixtieths of a single degree. It is situated on latitude 30 degrees, which is a significant latitude, one third of the way between the equator and the North Pole. And it gives you the dimensions of the Earth on a scale defined by a key motion of the Earth itself, which is the precession of the Earth's axis. For all that to be a coincidence is just lunacy yeah. on my, from my point of view. It's obviously not a coincidence. It's obviously deliberate. And this tells us that sometime in remote prehistory, there were great minds at work on this planet who were doing extraordinary things and seeking to pass messages down to the future. It's slightly spooky that we're half a precessional cycle away from the last big impact. There's no question. Um, that's really remarkable. Uh, 
you know what, what's amazing to me about that also is they knew that we would attain this again and it's almost like it's vouchsafed. There. I can't prove that, but I feel that's the way. I feel, I feel that a message has been sent forward deliberately to our time. And it's not an accident that the astronomers who are working on the Torrid Meteor Stream say that the next 30 years are crunch time between us and the Torrid Meteor Stream. And they are largely being ignored, but attention should be paid to them. And, and this, this work is again published in solid peer-reviewed journals. It's not fringe science. It needs to be looked at, and I set out the documentation in the, in, in, in the book. Uh, is it possible that the ancients knew that, that the, that the cataclysm that brought down their civilization was part of a cycle, was something that didn't just happen once, was something that would happen again, that we would re-encounter those bits of the torrid meteor stream that are particularly dangerous 12,800 years after our first encounter? Remarkable, absolutely remarkable. Um, I have to say that probably the biggest breakthrough in the book relates to DNA, interestingly enough. And again, I have to put my hand on my heart and state clearly, that is not my breakthrough. Yes. I am simply reporting what the leading scientists in the field have observed. Um, and the leading scientists in the field of ancient DNA, um, publishing again in Nature, um, people like Professor Eski Willislev of the University of Copenhagen and, and Cambridge, uh, Skoglund and Reich, many others, um, have published key articles in Nature about this. Uh, there is a very puzzling DNA signal, which you find only in Australasia and in the heart of the Amazon jungle. And you don't find it anywhere else. You don't find it on the supposed route of migration up through East Asia and across the Bering Land Bridge and into America and down through. You don't find it anywhere on that route. You don't find it in North America. You don't find it in Central America. You only find it amongst Australian Aborigines and Melanesians from Papua New Guinea and amongst certain tribes in the Amazon rainforest. And furthermore, it's really old. Uh, and again, this is where science and the study of ancient DNA is really changing things in archaeology because skeletal remains from the Brazilian Amazon dated to 10,400 years ago carry this same signal. And that tells us that the signal has been in the Amazon for at least 10,400 years and probably long before that, given how little of the Amazon has actually been studied. And it's certainly the view of the researchers who published this report. Uh, that that signal reached the Amazon in the late Ice Age. So then you have to say, how did it get there in the late Ice Age? It certainly didn't come by that land route or it would have left DNA fingerprints. It must have come across the ocean. A reproductively viable population must have been brought all the way across the Pacific Ocean and settled in the Amazon rainforest where their descendants remain to this day, still carrying that DNA signal. And this is regarded as completely impossible by archaeology, that human beings would have been capable of crossing an ocean on the scale of the Pacific. Maybe one or two individuals on rafts by accident might have made it. But a reproductively viable population which can preserve a specific set of genes and pass them down over hundreds of generations is a completely different proposition. That's a large settlement project. And for that, to, for that to be documented in the ancient DNA of the Amazon is absolutely intriguing and very hard to explain. And I'd like to be clear, I don't dispute that the Polynesians were amazing navigators uh, and that the Polynesians were the masters of the Pacific Ocean. But that was 3,000 years ago or 3,500 years ago. That was not 13,000 years right. ago. For such a voyage to have taken place 13,000 years ago in itself rewrites history. Uh, and again, the problem is that archaeology are now looking for ways to explain this away. Rather than, rather than considering what does this mean for our paradigm of the past, they would like the whole thing just to go away. Mm -hmm. uh, this I, is amazing because like uh, when the evidence was presented geologically for the Sphinx, mm. that the water weathering dated it back to somewhere near 10,000 BC, uh, archaeology, which was more opinion-based and largely, as I found out through your work, uh, Egyptology largely comes from 19th, 18th, 19th century research. Yep. Um, so, you know, with our modern tools, you might think you'd update that picture at a certain point. Yes, yeah. I, I, I think, the, for example, the rigid and fixed view of archaeology that no humans were capable of crossing a major ocean with a reproductively viable population 13,000 years ago, uh, the very first thing they should do with this ancient DNA is question that view. 
<laughs> rather than question the, the, the new facts. Right. You know, so the, the, the effort is to, is to question and pour scorn upon the new facts, rather than to consider what the new facts mean for our previous models of how, of how things were done. And it's, just, it's just unfortunate that that, is, that that is the case. But it won't go on. And I, I, I see more and more evidence as I travel around. I meet young archaeologists in the field who are very different from their elderly colleagues uh, and, and who, who are much more open-minded and much more willing to... You see to, a change. I, I definitely see a change yeah. and, I, and I see it in... Uh, I, I meet many students who've, who've, who've enrolled in archaeology and are learning archaeology and they are carrying a passionate wish to change archaeology and to make it and to make it into the discipline that it can be, which is an open-minded and adventurous exploration of our past rather than a rigid and hierarchical pre imposed view of what our past should be. Absolutely. Uh, it's remarkable. Uh, we're going to open it up to questions in a couple of minutes, everyone. It's great to have everyone here. Uh, Graham's new book, Is America Before? It's, it's a remarkable breakthrough on many levels uh, because we're getting into archaeology, we're getting into DNA, we're getting into various scientific disciplines that you brought forward in it. Um, the, um, there was one aspect I wanted to get into which was this thing about squaring the circle mm. and how that gives us that picture also. Can you get yeah. into that a bit? Well, it, it's, it's first of all important to be clear that what uh, I draw attention to, what happens in the Amazon and what also happened in Ohio was a mathematical and geometrical exercise similar to the Greek notion of squaring the circle, but certainly not identical to it. Okay. They're playing the same kind of mathematical and geometrical game. So, so what you have in the, in the Amazon at a site called Jaco Sa, uh, on a scale of 200 meters, let's say 650 feet along each side, uh, what you have uh, is a enormous square embankment with a square ditch inside it with a second square embankment inside that and then with a circle touching the edges of that second inner square so they are so they are comparing squares and circles and the areas of the two of the two objects and they're doing so not just in a theoretical way but in a very large earthwork uh, on the ground which photographed from the air shows you very clearly the circle contained within the within the square uh, and these kind of mathematical and geometrical exercises that we see unmistakable proof of in the Amazon because they're there, you know, they can't be magicked away or wiped out, they're sitting there, uh, have traditionally been attributed to the Greek geometers uh, and, and been it not been considered that such clever and sophisticated games uh, could have been played in ancient Native America, not only in the Amazon, but also in Pike County, Ohio, where there was a very similar earthwork, w which had, in this case, a circle enclosing a square. And uh, that, unfortunately, is one of the tens of thousands of earthworks that, that have been destroyed uh, by development uh, in North America since the middle of the 19th century. It was documented by Squire and Davis in 1846. There's a map of it but it no longer exists. And that, that's true of many, many sites, unfortunately, yes. in the Americas. In fact, I would say that roughly 90% of the giant, uh, impressive earthwork sites of North America uh, that were documented in the 19th century are now gone completely. And they've been plowed under for agriculture or turned into industrial parks or, or housing estates. They've just, been, they've just been swept away. How did the Serpent Mound survive? I think Serpent Mound survived because it was kind of adopted locally, that local, local people paid attention to it, uh, yeah. who had the power to keep it there. It was a beautiful thing, and after mm -hmm. all, it's a, it's, it's a tourist attraction. Yes, yeah. right. Okay. Yeah. It, has, it has economic potential, as, yeah. does, as does Cahokia, um, as does um, uh, Newark uh, Earthworks in Ohio, uh, which is one of the most uh, majestic earthwork sites in the whole of the Americas. Uh, Newark Earthworks has many geometrical figures, but the most important is a combination of an octagon and a circle. And uh, by the way, that combination of the octagon and circle targets uh, every one of the key rising and setting points of the moon over its 18.6 year cycle. However, it's still there because it's inside a private golf club. Uh, a private golf club set itself up 
uh, in the heart of Newark Earthworks uh, back at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and they make a point and they advertise their golf club that, that in fact on 11 of the 18 holes you may play golf amongst mysterious ancient Native American earthworks. Unbelievable. Well, the fact is, al although I do find that annoying, the fact is that that site would not be there at all if it hadn't been turned into a golf course. Wow. It's the commercial interest that's kept that site yeah. that's kept that site alive. There's movement now for the Ohio History Connection, which also runs Serpent Mound, to take over the Newark Earthworks. And I hope that will happen because it, it should be, it first of all, should be preserved. And thank you to the Private Country Club for preserving it thus far. But it should be preserved for the whole public, not just for those who can pay to get into a private country club. This is a global legacy, not a, not a private legacy. Absolutely. Um, one of the kind of short asides that you make in the book is how, how it almost seems like people are chosen or people are elected to protect a particular ancient site. I find that as I, as I go around the world. Klaus that, Schmidt. That, that very, very much in the case of Klaus Schmidt at Gobekli Tepe, who, who was a, a brilliant researcher and, and um, very open-minded as to what Gobekli Tepe meant. Uh, and, and wholly responsible for the revelation of Gobekli Tepe, for the excavation, for bringing it forth before the public. Unfortunately, he died in 2014. And the new regime who've taken over at Gobekli Tepe are very different people um, who do not, in my view, respect the sanctity of the site uh, or, or its importance. Um, and, and um, you know, there, there, there are many others. Ross Hamilton at, at Serpent Mound uh, has uh, basically volunteered his life uh, to protecting and interpreting and drawing attention to that incredibly significant site. Uh, John Anthony West and ancient Egypt, you know, they're, they're, these, these yes. individuals uh, become self-appointed guardians uh, for a past that for a long time it seems that nobody cares about. But thank goodness there are some who do care. Do you call them hierophanes? Is that the word? Hierophants. I hierophants. think that's just another word for a kind of priest. Yes, yeah, right, yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of a fascinating way to look at it. I also like the idea that the nature is instructing people where to put the sacred sites. Yeah. That's a reverse. We, well, it is because, because the ancients knew that we are part of nature and that we resonate with nature and we need to listen to nature. And nature cannot be separated from the cosmos. This bubble of a planet is floating in a giant ocean of the cosmos. Everything is connected. We're connected to the most distant parts of the cosmos, the parts that we cannot even imagine or see. Nevertheless, we are connected to them. We're part of this. So this connectedness that comes through is the message of ancient civilizations, whereas what comes through in our civilization is disconnectedness. If we're disconnected from the Earth. We don't see the Earth as a sacred realm. We see the Earth as a um, material commodity to be mined and, and exploited uh, and, and, and used uh, without, without any sense of the sacred, without any sense that this is a goddess who is willingly giving us of her gifts to allow us to flourish and develop upon her, but who expects us to give back in certain ways. Uh, our, our society regards itself with such pride and arrogance as just cut off from that. We cut ourselves off from the sky, live in a city you never see the stars. You know, and, and, and this, this failure to respect the earth is evident in, in the horrific story of pollution around the world in, in, in the elaboration of, of nuclear weapons. I mean, what, what an insane, what an insane and incredibly stupid thing to do uh, to invent nuclear weapons in the first place, but then having done so to allow them to proliferate around the world. It, it, only a, a society that's really lost contact with its sanity would do that. Yes. These are incredibly dangerous, poisonous, wicked, evil things. There is no justification for having them whatsoever. We do not, they do not defend us. They put us in great danger. How can this not be, how can this not be obvious to, to anybody? I don't, I don't know, but it's because we live in a disconnected society. Disconnected from the universe, disconnected from nature, disconnected from ourselves, disconnected from our own consciousness, disconnected from our own sovereignty over our own health. Absolutely. Uh, well, when you think about the nuclear thing, it seemed like three decades ago they were closer to solving it, and now they're, they want to reinstall the whole arms race all over again. I despair. <laughs> <laughs> I despair. The, I, I do want if to we mention were a rational and a sane society, 
we would make it a high priority to get rid of these things and to figure out other ways to get on with fellow human beings that don't involve hanging over their, head, their heads the threat of total annihilation. You know, that's not a great way to make friends with people. If you're not friends with us, we're going to annihilate you. No. The, the, the human race, we need to mature beyond that and come, on, and come on to a next level where we recognize that we are, in fact, all members of one family, uh, that we all have the same hopes and dreams, that we all have the same capacity for love, uh, that there are, there are no, the differences between human beings are far less important than the similarities, and we should focus on the similarities that we all share as the whole, as the whole human race. And if we did that, how could we possibly conceive of murdering millions of fellow human beings with nuclear weapons? How could we even think of doing that? Isn't it obvious that when we invest so much in that, that we are in fact insane as a society? Absolutely, absolutely, it's remarkable. Um, you know, one quick thing about, the book is so scientific and so well-researched in so many ways. Uh, and I think that you present the case and you back up the facts so well. And I know that you don't lend yourself to woo-woo in the book, as you say. But I do want to make this point, which is, it seems to me that some of those synchronicities we were talking about with people and sites mm. have happened to you also, including Gobekli Tepe, which you got a strange invitation to be there with Schmidt just before he died. Just before he died, yeah. Well, I've, I've, I've certainly played a part in, in spreading the word uh, about, about a number of these sites, and I'm, I'm glad that I've had the opportunity to do so. I feel, I feel very privileged to have had the opportunity to do so. And if I've had the opportunity to do so, it's entirely because of my readers. Uh, that's, that's how I get this work done. I don't rely on funding from any external sources. I don't raise money on the internet, but research trips cost money, and it's people who read my books uh, that make it possible for me to do that. So, gratitude. Thank Unbelievable. You. Fantastic. Um, the, uh, the idea that uh, when you were in your teens, you had this experience where you were electrocuted. Yeah, uh, I, had my, I had my near death experience. Yes. Yeah. Um, do you think that has given you some insight that maybe an ordinary researcher wouldn't have had because they didn't? I mean, can you describe the I made, I made little of it at the time. Yeah, um, well, yes, I, I've, I, I can describe the experience. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I had a party. My pa I was a teenager. I was 18. And my, and my parents had gone away for the weekend. And um, we lived in a little semi-detached house, you know, on a very sort of quiet street. But I had... I threw a party, an all-night party, with 300 people at it, and, and, uh, and it was wild, and the neighbors were fu furiously angry, and the house was trashed, and, and then the next day I was left alone, pretty much everybody went, and finally by the early evening, my parents were due back late at night, uh, by, the early, by the early evening I was alone in the house, and, and cleaning up the last of the mess, and in the kitchen, um, washing up. Uh, with bare feet, uh, I'd already spilt water on the floor from the sink and I had bare feet and wet hands and then I got this obsessional urge to check that the back of the refrigerator was plugged in, uh, which I'd done many times before because I am slightly obsessional and, and, uh, and I didn't look, I just put my hand to where the plug was and what had happened was during the night the back of the plug had got knocked off um, and I put my wet hand standing in wet feet uh, in a pool of water on the live terminals and, and uh, suffered a massive electric shock and definitely left my body. I, I had a distinct experience of being up there around the light and looking down on myself. And, and um, I just thought it was really interesting. I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I just thought this is really, this is really interesting. And, 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 and then I was back in my body and, and I, I didn't have all the other aspects of the near-death experience at all. It was just that fe feeling of, of leaving my body, an out-of-body experience that I, that I had. And I guess that what it did was it, it helped me to, it helped me in the long term to, uh, to, to get to grips with the realization that I really came to much later in life, which is that we are not our bodies. I was open to that realization because I'd had that experience uh, as, a, as, as, a, as a teenager. And um, Fantastic. I wrote a poem about it at the time. I used to write poems in those days. And I found the poem recently. Uh, and and um, 
what I remembered uh, was the, and uh, the poem didn't have a firm date on it, it just said May of the year 19, I believe it was 1968, I need to check my notes. Um, and I was able, because I knew it was a full moon that night, I went for a walk with my dog afterwards and saw the full moon. Uh, I remembered that it had been the full moon, so I was then able to search for the date of the full moon in May 1968, and I believe it was the 12th of May. Again, I'd have to double check. Wow. I found the actual date that it... You were able to track it back? Track it back to yes. when, it, when, it, when it happened, and I was 18, coming on 19 years old uh, at, the, at, at, at the time. Anyway, it was um, at least an interesting experience. No question. Well, the um, mystery schools and that whole kind of tradition would say you astral traveled right there, and... Yeah, I had I had some, and I firm I'm firmly of the view that we are that we are not our bodies, and that we're here to learn and to grow and to develop, and that to the extent that our society nourishes us in that learning and growth and development process, it's a good thing, and to the extent that it diminishes us and shuts us down and prevents us from learning and growing and developing, it's a bad thing, and we should change the bad things and focus on the good things. Fantastic. I just want to ask you briefly. Uh, Graham, John Anthony West, uh, a colleague of yours, close friend, uh, passed away uh, fairly recently last year. And, 2018, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you spent, uh, you had actually a, a remarkable interview together with him, his last interview. Yeah. Um, can you tell us anything about that? connection that you guys had it was, it was quite remarkable and inspired a lot of people well i, I first met john in 1993 uh, in in egypt um, i had become aware of his fantastic guidebook to egypt traveler's key to ancient egypt by john anthony west if anybody wants a real guidebook to egypt that's the one to go for um, and and uh, I was using it as my guidebook when I was doing some research travels in Egypt in 1993 when I discovered that John was in Luxor and leading a tour. Uh, so uh, I went to see him and I had my first meeting with him and after that we became very close friends and colleagues over a very, very long period of time and had uh, many um, in, I would regard him as a comrade in arms, you know, mm -hmm. many, many uh, engagements with the yes. uh, forces of archaeology. <laughs> um, and and uh, the, the friendship grew and developed. And, and finally, I proposed to John in, in 2016 that we do a, an onstage interview uh, together. I was doing an event in New York anyway. And, and I said, why not join me? And before I do my event, let's, let me interview you and uh, try to bring out some of your wisdom and knowledge for, for the public. And I'm very glad I did that, because a month later he was diagnosed with cancer, and a few months later he was dead. Remarkable, yeah. Yeah. remarkable. Yeah. Incredible legacy of work that he left. And it's so interesting with the two of you, because you're so uh, different in a way, just stylistically. And he was sort of like the gruff Indiana Jones guy, and you, yeah. you had all the facts and you had all the research. Oh, John had all the facts, too. Yes. Yeah, you could never defeat John on the facts. <laughs> I've, yet to, I've yet to meet an archaeologist who could even stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with him in an argument. He is a brilliant debater. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and his fundamental look at Egypt was on that same thing, which is that it was a legacy culture. Very much. Not a legacy, uh, not a development, but a legacy. That's John's words. Um, that, this is, that this is how the, um, the mystery of the perfection that you find at the beginning of the ancient Egyptian story can be explained and why it actually goes downhill after that. I mean, the pyramids of the fifth and the sixth dynasties are shambolic by comparison with the fourth dynasty pyramids. Uh, and the best explanation for that in John's words is that ancient Egypt was not a development, it was a legacy. Incredible. Yeah. Wow. Everyone, uh, it's great to have you here. The book is uh, America Before the Key to Earth's Lost Civilization. Graham, uh, a remarkable work and Thank you. Uh, three decades or more of uh, truly remarkable insights. So we really thank you and thank you so much for being here. It's my privilege. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.